Mass Effect Andromeda is a mess. The Webster's Dictionary defines this game as quantity over quality. Feed the masses, sure, but give them one cut of the finest filet mignon around or 20 McDonald's hamburgers. BioWare went for the burgers on this one. Mass Effect Andromeda is a good idea in concept, a bold new direction for the series, a technical upgrade in most ways, but a huge downgrade in almost every other way. The deep and interesting story is gone from this series. The impactful interactions are nowhere to be found. The impact of decisions is a distant memory, one that feels wispy and unfamiliar like a childhood recollection. Instead, we get bland characters, uninteresting plot lines, an open world full of junk side content that feels like filling in boxes on a checklist you get from your boss more than it does playing a video game. Mass Effect Andromeda is not a good game. It does some good things, and there's some interesting ideas here, but those interesting ideas are hidden beneath thousands of pounds of scrap metal. Searching through the junkyard leaves you covered in dirt, bloodied and cut up, and these brief moments of clarity are not worth trudging through the mess surrounding them. This was my first time playing this game. When it released, there was so much controversy around the animations and the bugs that I didn't think it was even worth it at the time. Plus, I didn't really have any interest in seeing a great series fall from grace. Covering this game now, most of the technical issues are fixed, and when I say most, I mean there are still plenty that linger in this now abandoned and forgotten project. Because of that, I never had the bias that came along with playing the broken product that was delivered to the public. I also want to point out that I'm not riding some bandwagon here with the Andromeda hate. I genuinely went into this game hoping that it would shock me. I hoped that the bugs were the worst problem that the game had. I wanted to have a contrarian opinion on this one, but the game's issues run much deeper than just facial animations, glitches, and bugs. The technical issues can be fixed. The story, gameplay, and general structure cannot and will not be patched. I think this game was going in the right direction, but many factors gave us the final product that we got. It would ultimately be the last game we've seen in the Mass Effect series, though there is a new one on the horizon. Today, we're going to talk about Mass Effect Andromeda. We'll be delving deep into story, gameplay, mechanics, and everything in between. If you haven't seen my previous videos on the Mass Effect series, you should probably go watch those now, as it'll give you better insight into how this series succeeded up to this point. If you enjoy the video and you want to support the channel, you can do so by liking and subscribing as it really helps out with the algorithm. You can also support me over on Patreon where I upload longer versions of the full series retrospectives and scattered text post ramblings. You can also follow me on Twitch where I play games that I'm not currently reviewing. Spoilers for Mass Effect Andromeda. Hey dad, it's me, your favorite son, and today I'd like to talk about Mass Effect Andromeda. Mass Effect Andromeda began development in 2012 after the release of Mass Effect 3. It was being developed now by a Bioware Montreal team rather than the Edmonton studio that had led the work on the original trilogy. The first decision made was to not include Commander Shepard in this new entry. They mainly did this to untether themselves from the Paragon Renegade system. The team also wanted more creative freedom with this entry and didn't want to be locked into a trilogy. They originally wanted to make a prequel, but the reception just wasn't there. The team wanted to learn from past mistakes and successes. They decided to take elements from previous entries that worked and include them in this game, while also staying wary of things that didn't go over well, like the ending of Mass Effect 3. Honestly, I'm surprised the studio even had the will to release another Mass Effect game after the reception to 3's ending. I can imagine it would be incredibly difficult to get back on that horse, knowing what had just happened. Though, to be fair, Mass Effect 3 was incredibly successful and there was no way EA was going to let that success go to waste. The team wanted to place a special focus on exploration in this entry. They wanted explorable worlds, and early in development they were considering procedural generation to be able to have 
thousands of planets to traverse. This was eventually scrapped due to lack of resources. The series had also changed directors at this point, now headed by Gerard Leoni. Casey Hudson, the original trilogy's director, was made executive producer and then left Bioware in 2014. Leoni also left the project and was replaced by Mac Walters as director. He had worked as a writer on the original trilogy, particularly as one of the lead writers on Mass Effect 2 and the lead writer on Mass Effect 3. Mass Effect Andromeda required a lot of work. They had to switch to EA DICE's Frostbite 3 engine. Considering the fact that the previous game used Unreal Engine, this meant the team had to build everything from the ground up. The game had a delayed production cycle, and the team struggled with many different aspects of the engine. They enlisted help from other developers to nail down the controls for the driving, and they could never really get a handle on the facial animations. The team wasn't used to the new system, and with lots of understaffing, this meant that area of the game suffered. Mass Effect Andromeda was officially released on March 21st, 2017 for PlayStation 4, Xbox One, and PC. Before we begin, I have some notes on the review itself. First, I played Mass Effect Andromeda on the PS5 using the system's backward compatibility feature. There isn't an upgraded version of the game for the new system, so it's just the PS4 version running on the new system. I still had tons of frame rate issues and many bugs, of which we'll talk about in a bit. The second note is about the structure of this review. Normally, I like to tailor each review to the games that I'm playing. If you've seen my previous videos on the Mass Effect series, you'll know that this is meant doing two playthroughs, each with opposing decisions made. This effectively showcased the strengths of Mass Effect's decision-making system and contrasted the different playthroughs to see the different outcomes. I chose not to do this for Mass Effect Andromeda. I actually struggled with this decision quite a bit throughout my first playthrough. With the removal of the Paragon and Renegade system in this game, and the lack of real decisions that we can make throughout the game, there really isn't a point. Both playthroughs would be virtually the same, albeit with some tonal differences in conversation and things said, but both journeys would arrive at the same destination. I was kind of disappointed when I reached this conclusion, as making those sections of the videos, as I've done in the past, were always some of my favorites. Andromeda really just doesn't warrant it, though. I will be talking about the reason for this decision throughout the video, though, as the lack of results from decisions is one of my biggest complaints with this game. Mass Effect Andromeda begins with some setup. We actually get a decently in-depth character creator here that can let us adjust all manner of things. It's not the craziest I've seen, but it's not what I expected from this game. We can pick a training, which is sort of a class, but not really, because Andromeda's class system works a little differently than previous entries. The system is called Profiles, and we'll go a bit more in-depth with that later. I chose to leave my name as Scott Ryder. Interesting thing about Scott, though, is that he has a twin. This twin's appearance can be customized as well, meaning they must have some sort of impact on the game, right? We can also turn a setting on or off, which causes Scott's father, Alec, to inherit his appearance. This will adjust the character automatically to make him look more like me. I thought this was a little odd, just because I feel like it would have been cooler to have both the sibling and the father automatically inherit our appearance. This would have created an interesting situation on replays, or just talking about the game in general. People would quickly realize that both characters' appearances change whenever we change our own character. With this completed, we begin the game, which actually starts between Mass Effect 1 and 2. The Andromeda Initiative has been created to send multiple arcs of people to another galaxy, the Andromeda Galaxy. The motivation for this is incredibly unclear until later in the game, when we unlock an optional side quest and find this information out for ourselves. For now, it just seems like they're doing it because they like exploring. This is also a little odd, because for most of the game, the whole reason we're here is to just... we explore! The journey is quite long, though, and takes 634 years. This is when our game actually takes place, the year 2819, long after the events of the Mass Effect trilogy in a place far away from home. Scott Ryder is on the Human Ark and wakes up from his cryosleep. The Arcs are split into five species, Human, Solarian, Asari, Turian, and Quarian. 
There are some Krogans here that are interspersed throughout the Nexus and other places, but the Volus, Drell, Elcor, and Hanar are not present in the entire game. The Quarians actually aren't either, but we'll get into why later. There's a story reason as to why, but I have a feeling it's because they didn't have the resources to manage that many models for whatever reason. Ryder is being explained his SAM implant, a simulated adaptive matrix. It's a neural implant that is supposed to increase the natural abilities that humans have. Before we can get into the full explanation on this, the arc that we're on has encountered the Scourge, a large alien mass that's floating out in space. Sarah, our twin's cryopod, has been damaged, and she can't be woken from cryo sleep. The ship has also been damaged, and we have to fix some electronics, giving us a tutorial for the new scanner system. This system is used to gather research points that we'll talk about later. It can also be used to solve some puzzles throughout the game, which it works pretty well for. The system overall, though, is pretty clunky and useless. The things that you can scan are never consistent. The game just randomly decides when something will be scannable, and just when I thought I had the hang of it, I'd pull my scanner out and nothing. We head to the front of the ship and we meet the Pathfinder, Scott's father. The Pathfinder is a title that's pretty important in the Andromeda Initiative. They have a lot of power in decision making and determining what happens with the civilizations. The Pathfinders have the SAM AI equipped so that they can easily determine whether a planet is viable for settling or not. Alec Ryder is the current human Pathfinder. He wants to head down to the planet to get out of this strange energy storm in space. The planet Habitat 7 was their target, the initiative's golden world to be colonized and settled. The planet seems to have changed in the 600 year journey though, and it doesn't seem habitable now. We gear up to head down to the planet with Alec and Korra, another soldier who's next in line to become Pathfinder. Now, Andromeda has a love-hate relationship with Alec and the main character. It's hot and cold because it can't decide whether it wants Alec to be a loving, supportive father or whether he should be a deadbeat dad. Sometimes he outright ignores us, sometimes he provides moral support. It's very strange. The writing is back and forth and we can't figure out how to feel about this character. It honestly creates a weird sort of whiplash for the audience, a strange neutral ground where we resign ourselves to feeling nothing about him. As the shuttles approach the planet, they're shot down by lightning. We get a very strange falling sequence that feels like we should be controlling our character here, but we're not allowed, just fall straight down. I already made it very clear how I feel about this game. I'm not fond of it, but it does get some things right, and I won't fail to mention the things that I do genuinely like about it. For instance, the game looks great. Some of the environments are gorgeous. Andromeda creates a great first impression aesthetically by giving us a massive rocky planet that's constantly plagued by lightning storms. We'll talk about this a lot more later, but unfortunately these open and pretty environments are generally filled with the most nothing you can imagine. We have Liam on our squad here as we try to find the rest of the crew. Liam is easily the most annoying and worst companion that we get in the game. He's designed to be a sort of casual comic relief, but his dialogue is written so poorly. Half the time he's making bad jokes, the other half of the time he just comes off as really condescending. This is probably more a problem with direction than it is acting. It's definitely a writer problem as well, but a lot of this game really seems like the voice actors had no guidance on how they were supposed to read the lines. We eventually encounter an alien race on Habitat 7. We try to make peace with them, but they're not making peace with us, and we're forced to fight. Speaking of fighting, we should talk about the combat a bit. I really hated the changes made to combat when I first started the game, but they sort of grew on me over time. It functions quite a bit like previous games. We can shoot enemies with weapons and we have powers that we can use and level up. The largest difference here is that the system itself has been greatly restricted. We can obtain tons of powers or abilities through the new system. Ryder himself has access to a lot with three branching trees, combat, biotic, and tech. A variety of active and passive abilities populate these trees, but we can only equip three active ones at a time. 
I see this as a huge step back in terms of freedom. There is a way around this by favoriting and switching out powers mid-battle, but you get a forced cooldown and it's just not worth it. Not only that, but we can't choose what skills our squad uses. They just do their own thing. This restriction is leveled out a bit because the combat system has been expanded to include verticality. We can now use jetpacks to jump in the air and even dash forward. This makes dodging attacks a lot easier and moving around simpler. I actually do like the traversal in this game and always thought Mass Effect was in desperate need of a jump button, so it's nice to see here. The combat overall does feel a lot more fluid. We can move around the battlefield, quickly dodge attacks, fire off shots, and use powers at the click of a button. They definitely wanted to refine the combat system to appeal to more modern fans and give players less time to pause. The enemies we fight aren't great though, there's very little variety in enemy types throughout the whole game. With the massive amount of quests and things that there are to do, you get real tired of seeing the same ones over and over. On top of that, the enemy AI seems to be a bit broken because they often get confused and just start running from cover to cover or running away from the battle entirely, making it sometimes tedious to end fights. The cover system is also atrocious. We enter cover just by walking up to it, but we don't lock into it, so sliding to the edge of cover will just see us standing again. We also have to manually switch which shoulder we're looking through, which is just something I hate personally, a huge pet peeve of mine. I know some people like it, but a game should work well enough that it switches for you when behind cover, and you shouldn't really notice. All of this creates a mild combat system overall. Towards the end, I had found the sweet spot and gotten it to work pretty well, but it can be really annoying and troublesome at times. It's also just a large simplification overall, which in this case, I'm not a huge fan of. Over time, we'll be reunited with the Pathfinder on this planet. We have to fight through this alien race across the surface and rescue multiple crew members. Andromeda really likes to meander with its missions, and each one feels way too long. This one is a perfect example because it takes forever to get going. I don't mind long missions as long as there's things going on, but there just aren't here. We have optional tasks to investigate alien ruins or save crew members. The alien ruins might seem cool, but there's nothing there. No cool mystery at the end or sigils, we just kill some bots and that's it. Eventually we find Alec and he's set his sights on the monolith in front of him. This relic seems to be causing the lightning storms. We charge into the battle and this sequence with the Pathfinder is actually kind of cool. It was a good choice to put the player in the shoes of an NPC here. We're seeing what a specter can really do. This would be like playing as a character from the original trilogy and watching Shepard fight. He's just better than us and all we can do is hope to aspire to that someday. It's a great idea for a sequence, watching him rip through enemies as we struggle to follow behind. We have to guard a panel while Alec interfaces with it. He unlocks the monolith and we head inside. There, Sam shuts off the power to the alien structure, but it causes some foreign material to blast both Alec and Scott backwards. Scott's visor cracks, causing him to be open to the elements. Alec gives Scott his helmet and transfers the role of Pathfinder to him, sacrificing himself. Back on the Hyperion Arc, Scott wakes up. We're told that he was pronounced dead and Sam had to make a deeper connection with Ryder to bring him back. He's now the Pathfinder and he can use Sam in ways that others can't. Korra isn't very happy about this because she was next in line to be Pathfinder. We see the Archon for the first time. This is Andromeda's big bad. He's the leader of this alien race, and he seems to be interested in the technology that Alec interacted with. He can't seem to get it to work, though, which upsets him. We finally arrive at the Nexus. The Andromeda Initiative was started by a woman named G.N. Garson. Garson wanted the Andromeda Galaxy to have its own citadel, which is why the Nexus was created. But when we arrive on the Nexus, we realize that not all is well. The entry area is basically shut down and there's no one around. Until we find a worker who leads us to the skeleton crew running the place. We find out that the Nexus has been here for two years, and the people on it have barely been able to survive. None of the other arcs have arrived yet, which is worrying because they should have by now. There's been a mutiny on board the Nexus in those two years. Jan Garson is dead, the Scourge, their name for the glowing electrical storm caused damage to the ship, 
everything is bad. Jaren Tan is now the head of the initiative, a Solarian who is voiced by Kumail Nanjiani, who isn't playing a Solarian, he's just playing Kumail Nanjiani with slight voice modulation. I oversee the entire initiative, and I have decided to give you a chance to prove yourself. The arrival of the Pathfinder is somewhat of a good sign, though, because he's a beacon of hope. Even though Alec is dead, Ryder now has the ability to guide them and determine viable planets for them to settle on. We also meet Foster Addison, the Director of Colonial Affairs, the person making sure colonists can survive and live. This is where the infamous, my face is tired line comes from. Sorry, my face is tired from dealing with everything. I want to talk about the writing here a bit. A lot of the dialogue is like this in the game. The characters just aren't written to talk like people for some reason. Not every single line uttered is cringy, but a lot of them are. The overall story is very weak as well, which we'll get into over time. A lot of the game feels very bland and uninspired. The whole tone is on the level of a bargain bin young adult novel. The general vibe has been drastically changed from the previous games as well. Everything is very jokey and lighthearted, which I don't mind very much if it was kept consistent. The dialogue choice system has greatly changed as well. We no longer have the Paragon Renegade system, but something completely different. Now, there are four different options to choose from, four ways to respond to a conversation. Emotional, logical, casual, or professional. To be clear, these dialogue options generally affect nothing. They just affect how we respond and don't carry any weight in how the character thinks of us or how the story unfolds. There are decision icons that will note a decision that we have to make, but 80% of these have little to no effect either. On top of that, it doesn't really matter which one of the four options that we pick, because Ryder still just responds in a quirky, sarcastic manner in most situations. It's like you made an uncharismatic Joker the main character of the game. The professional dialogue choice seemed the most different, and a lot of the time actually seemed like something Shepard would just say normally. It was more of a getting straight to the facts option. But across the board, you never really know how you're going to come off. I do think this entire system was a great idea. In theory, it would lead to the players picking more morally gray options rather than red or blue. This was a big complaint with the previous system that we were always picking 50-50 options. This system tried to get away from that though, which is good, but the execution just gives us a result that makes us feel like we're always picking one option. We no longer have a choice at all. The writing and the tone are odd as well, and looking into who was responsible for this is kind of difficult. There aren't a ton of consistent answers, but it seems like there were three. John Dombrow, who helped write Mass Effect 3, did work on the Telltale Game of Thrones games, wrote some atrocious-looking horror films, wrote Anthem, and is unfortunately currently working on Dragon Age Dreadwolf. Kathleen Rootsart seems to have no previous writing experience for games, but went on to write Star Wars Squadrons, helped write Battlefield 2042, and is now working at Azra Games, which is a fucking NFT video game company. Chris Schlurf ended up writing Destiny Rise of Iron and some Star Wars stuff. None of these people have shining records or history, mostly just junk, drab, bland, shill stuff. Dombrow at least wrote quite a bit of Mass Effect 3, and it seems mainly dealt with the Genophage arc, the Javik DLC, and the Grissom Academy mission, which were some of my favorite things in that game. I'm just not sure how this team was allowed to run rampant with this AAA game. It's kind of insane. Regardless, Addison hates us because she doesn't think we're fit to lead. Tan decides to have us go out there and start evaluating planets. The first is Habitat 1, or Eos. It's a planet that should be habitable and is in range of the Nexus. He also introduces us to our new crewmate, Vetra Nix, a Turian smuggler who is joining us on our mission. Before we leave, we get to meet some of the higher-ups on the Nexus. Cash is a female Krogan, an engineer who was partly responsible for building the Nexus, and Kondros is a Turian and the leader of the Nexus security systems. 
I did a side quest here to help an engineer figure out who was sabotaging his systems. This sees us running around the ship and scanning different panels and talking to people. It's incredibly simple, boring, and bland. This is how a lot of the side content is in Andromeda. This isn't that offensive in and of itself, it's the amount of boring content that there is. There are so many side quests in this game that have no effect and that are incredibly unworthy of your time. It's just so much stuff. Meaningless, useless, unimpactful stuff. That's the theme for this game. It doesn't mean anything. There's no reason. It's just there and there's a lot of it. Before we head down to Eos, we get our ship, the Tempest. I actually like the Tempest and its layout. It's simple, pretty much the same functionality as the Normandy, and it looks really good. We can talk to each of our crew on the ship, either developing romances with them, friendships, or getting access to their loyalty missions. That's right, loyalty missions are back in this entry. I will say this is a welcome sight, but in true Mass Effect Andromeda fashion, there's always a downside. The loyalty missions have no effect on the overall game, other than gaining you an extra tier of skills for your particular squad mate. They don't tie into the story, they're entirely optional. They do, however, build out the characters pretty thoroughly. I don't think the missions themselves are as impactful as the ones in Mass Effect 2, primarily because those ones were heavily tied into the main story and the fates of the characters at hand. On top of that, there was much better storytelling and writing there. No loyalty mission in this game will reach the heights of Morden facing Malin over the genophage, or Jack reconciling with her childhood torture. On the Tempest, we can also use the research and development feature that this game offers. We can spend research data that we gain from scanning things around the world to get new items to build, and we can use the development terminal to build those weapons or armor. Building the armor requires pretty specific resources. The only problem is a lot of these resources are time-consuming to gather and just an incredible drain on fun. We can get them from opening containers, but also from mining around planets, which is a tedious affair. None of these items are even needed, either. I didn't even start changing my loadout until the last mission. I really only started experimenting with weapons and armor after I had already beaten the game. There are tons of different weapons to be researched, armor to be developed, mods that we can equip to both, consumables that will affect our bullets damage or increase our health, but none of it even matters. It's the most in-depth and complex system I've seen that doesn't matter at all. There's no reason to equip anything other than a mildly rare assault rifle and shotgun. We head down to Eos and get ready to establish our first colony. There's already people there, ones that were a part of the mutiny on the Nexus. They were exiled and had to spread out to the different habitable planets. This is a weird plot hole that there's people living on basically every planet, but we need to go down there and make sure it's habitable. All of the exiles of the Nexus left and already inhabited the planets, so what's the point? We just need to make it real comfy cozy for everyone. This mission introduces one of Andromeda's favorite activities, rerouting power. We have to do this so much throughout a variety of different missions that this game should really just be called Penelec Simulator 2017. That's a Pennsylvania joke for those that don't get it. In all seriousness though, a lot of these missions see us rerouting power or trying to power up devices so that we can use them. We're in an alien ruin and the best you could come up with was managing power? There's so much more that can be done with these ideas, but Bioware always decides to take the easy way out. After we get the colony powered up, we get access to the Nomad. We can drive this around planets and explore Andromeda's new open world structure. The driving on the Nomad isn't bad other than the fact that we have to switch between normal and six wheel drive to get up hills. We can also use the Nomad to mine resources like I talked about before. We travel to a nearby monolith that requires an alien code to use it. Because of this, we have to scan the area for glyphs. We get tackled by an Asari woman named PB. She's an Asari who is obsessed with remnant tech. The remnant are the civilization that's responsible for the monoliths on each planet. They were created by the Jardon, a race from this galaxy that not much is known about. We also find out the alien race we've been fighting so far are called the Ket. The Ket are very interested in remnant tech as well, and have been investigating it. 
we head across EOS to decipher each monolith. This is a common event that takes place on each planet that we encounter. Solving three monoliths will unlock a vault, which we journey through to stop the planet from having whatever uninhabitable environment that it currently does. Make no mistake, this doesn't physically alter the planet in any way. It's just a mission to get experience and meaningless currency. More importantly, it gets that little progress bar up. Doesn't it feel good, hamster? Run on the wheel. Run on the wheel until you're satisfied. Spoiler alert, you never will be. On top of that, these monoliths contain the laziest and most boring puzzle I've ever seen. Alien Sudoku. I'm not making a joke either, that's literally what it is. Once we find the glyph set a monolith, we have to fill in symbols making sure not to have any repeats in a row, column, or section. I genuinely had to look up how to do it because when I first saw it, I thought, there's no way they put Sudoku in this game. I was wildly wrong. They do have a feature that lets you use decoders to automatically solve the puzzle. I used these whenever I had them because slowing the game down for 5 minutes while I solve a 99 cent puzzle from the dollar store is not something I want to do in my sci-fi space opera. On top of that, each time you fail, enemies come out to attack you. It's all just so tiresome. While investigating the monoliths, we meet a Krogan named Drac, who's very powerful and not very friendly. After we investigate all of the monoliths, we can enter the vault on Eos. Investigating it, we realize it's being used to terraform the planet, which is causing the radioactive environment. If we shut it off, then Eos will be viable to start a colony on. We do shut it off and have to run away from one of those large clouds, a purification field. Once we leave, PB joins the crew and we have to find a place to put the new settlement. Drac is in some trouble and we help him out. After he sees us fight, he thinks we're also worthy to join. Now we can place our settlement, and we have a big decision to make. Finally, our first sign of large decisions that might affect the game. We have to choose whether we want this outpost to be a science-based one or a military-based one. If we choose military, this might send a bad message to the rest of the galaxy. But if we choose science, we might be leaving the settlement vulnerable. Not sure why we couldn't just go 50-50 on this one. So much for morally gray, right? I chose science because I didn't want to be a hostile threat in this new home we were developing, but I clearly put too much thought into it because this decision does not matter whatsoever. We'll have some conversations about it later based on what decisions we made, but that's literally the end of it. I figured at least we'd get some upgrades, maybe gathering more research points if we picked a science outpost, and maybe more development points if we picked military, but this doesn't affect anything at all. There are only a few major decisions that we can make throughout the course of the story. There are a bunch in the side quests, some that do have an effect and some that don't, but as for the main story, there's about four big decisions. None of these really have a massive effect on the game overall. Two of them determine whether a character that we don't know yet lives or dies. One of them is a genuine moral quandary, and the last is something that would have probably affected future games, but judging by this experience, I don't see that happening anytime soon. It's genuinely disappointing to see this game have almost no effect on its world or story. If we're not in the Milky Way, if Commander Shepard isn't around, if we don't care about any of these characters, if our choices don't matter, if there's nothing fun to do, is this really Mass Effect? We now have a settlement on Eos, where we can talk to people and pick up all manner of side quests. Back on the Nexus, we can talk to Sarah now, who's still in a coma. We create a telepathic connection between our implants and briefly speak with her. The vault that we unlocked on Eos has revealed the locations of other remnant vaults. This means that we need to spread out across the galaxy and track down more of them. Before we head out, we are introduced into the AVP system. This stands for Andromeda Viability Points. We get these points for completing various objectives throughout the game, main missions, side quests, miscellaneous tasks around the planets. Once this bar fills up, we get a cryopod point and can unlock a chunk of people that are still in cryosleep. This will generally give us rewards at specific intervals. For example, we can unlock scientists and get research points every 45 minutes or so, something we have to come back to the kiosk to pick up. The system is alright, I guess. I don't mind them putting a number or amount of progress on how viable a planet is. It's just the rewards that we get here that aren't really worth anything. Getting more consumables or research points means nothing because we don't really need them. 
Each planet has its own viability. This percentage can be increased, and once we get it past a certain threshold, we can put a new settlement there. This is side content that is completely optional. Getting this viability up isn't very hard. Placing forward points around the planet will get it up quite a bit, but the activity that moves it the most is finding the vaults on each planet. This is the same thing that we just did in the last story mission. We find three monoliths and unlock a vault, enter it, and turn off the terraforming. This makes the planet more livable, and we can make a settlement on that planet. The settlements don't really do anything, they just get that good old progress bar up higher, closer to 100%. This is where one of my biggest problems with Mass Effect Andromeda lies, its open world. I'm not really a big fan of open world games in general. There are games that have used open worlds to good creative success. Red Dead 2, Elden Ring, Death Stranding, Ghost of Tsushima. But the amount of games that include a vapid, needless open world is staggering compared to the few that use it well. Open world is just a must-have if you're making a AAA game now. It's not even thought of as an extra thing, it's just assumed it's going to be included. Most of these open worlds have nothing to offer. They take time to explore, running through them, picking up nodes, packages, completing objectives, all in the interest of getting that progress bar higher. Mass Effect Andromeda is the epitome of this. There are a lot of games that have generic open worlds that aren't bad games, like Spider-Man, for example. It's a pretty good game with a lot to do, and even though the stuff we complete is pretty generic, it's satisfying. You want to complete the task list, you welcome the tedium. Andromeda has an open world that is not satisfying, fun, interesting, or useful. It is void of any substance, an empty world full of uninteresting tasks to complete, all in the service of completion. It is the perfect example of a shell, a husk with nothing inside. Skin this game and you will find a black void that pulls you deeper and deeper into its nothing. Heading towards the next planet, we're met with the Archon who reveals that he wants our power to interact with the remnant technology. We escape him for now and head to Aya. Aya is the home to the Angara, as we soon find out, and they aren't easily trusting of us. They are also the only new friendly species that this game introduces. The Ket and the Remnant are the other two species that the Andromeda Galaxy has, bringing the grand total of new life to three. We need to get to the vault on this planet, but the only one that can access it is the Moshai, a religious leader for the Angaran people. Evra, the Angaran leader, doesn't trust us and wants us to help out the other two Angaran planets before we can meet the Moshai. We also now get a new squad mate, Jal, an Angaran fighter who's a bit of a cross between Garrus and Kasumi. We can now travel to either Havarl or Vold. I traveled to Vold to help the resistance there. The Angara have been fighting against the Ket for a while now and are constantly battling them. We have to rescue some kidnapped Angarans here. We can now head back and talk to the Moshai. Actually, no, because she's been captured. Ephra has tracked her down to a facility on Vold, where we just came from. There, we fight through tons of Ket and eventually see the exaltation process that the Ket are putting Angarans through. This is a transformation that turns them into Ket. It's worth noting here that the Ket look quite a bit like the Collectors from Mass Effect 2, just in general shape, and it turns out are also other species that have been transformed. Jal is upset at seeing what's been done to his people. We head into the boss fight with the Cardinal. I actually really like this boss fight. It has actual mechanics where we have to break down the boss's shield to damage him. To do this, we have to shoot a little spinning piece of equipment and damage it so the shield will go down. I did enjoy this because it was nice seeing genuine boss mechanics in a Mass Effect game, rather than just a big guy with a weak spot. It's unfortunate, though, that this is really the only boss fight like this in the game, and this enemy type is just reused over and over again throughout the story. We defeat the Cardinal, and he offers us a deal. He has tons of Angaran prisoners in this place, and will free them if we let him go and leave. The Moshai that we saved doesn't want to do this. She wants to destroy the place, killing the Angaran prisoners with it. She thinks leaving the Ket with this much power and tech is dangerous. I decided to just leave and take the prisoners. It wasn't worth more lives. We have to escort the Moshai out while we're attacked by tons of enemies. We eventually get a shuttle out and take the Moshai back. Aya is now open to the initiative to visit. We get access to the vault where the Moshai tells us that all of the vaults are connected to one central vault on a planet called Meridian. The central vault can activate all the others, but we don't know where Meridian is yet. The Archon has a map, but can't decipher it. 
We have to hunt down the Archon, but we have to first make our way to Kadara to find Venterev. He's an Angaran resistance member and knows where the Archon's ship is. Kadara itself is another Angaran colony, but also is filled with exiles from the Nexus. Terev is about to be executed, and we have to sneak into the prison to talk to him. He has a transmitter that will give us the location of the ship. We find it on Kadara and narrow the ship's location down to the Tefeno system. We have another two worlds that we can head to after this, Elodin, the desert planet that most of the Krogans have made home, and H047C, a moon-like planet with low gravity. These are optional planets though because we need to find that Archon. The Solarian Arc is here, docked on the Archon's ship. We find out the Solarian Pathfinder, Reka, is on board. We try to save the Solarians, but are caught in a trap by the Archon. Sam has to stop Ryder's heart to get him out of the trap. We find the map, and the Archon realizes that Sam is what he needs to interact with the Remnant tech, not Ryder himself. As we make our way out of the ship, we have another choice. We found some Krogan scouts aboard the ship, ones that Drac very much wants us to save. And Reka, the Solarian Pathfinder, is pinned down. I went to rescue Reka, meaning Drac's Krogan scouts were gone. He wasn't very happy with this decision. There's a side task pretty early on that leads us into trying to find the three missing arcs. The Solarian Arc that we find through the main story, the Turian Arc, and the Asari Arc. The Turian Arc has its own quest associated with it. There are some Turians that have crashed on Havarl, and we can help them out. We track the rest of the Cryptopods to Elodin and realize that most of them are dead. The Asari arc is actually tied to Korra's loyalty mission. She's obsessed with the Asari, and she actually became an Asari commando back in the Milky Way galaxy. She respects them quite a lot. One in particular, Sarissa Theris, is a commando that she idolizes greatly. When we find the arc, we realize that Theris has become the Pathfinder. We help the arc get going again, but eventually find out that Theris has made a massive mistake that led to the original Asari Pathfinder's death. We can decide at the end of the mission whether we want to reveal the secret or not and tell everyone. Of course, Theris doesn't want us to, and Korra does. I chose to keep it secret. This choice controls who the Asari Pathfinder becomes. It's about time to head to Meridian, though, considering that we know the location and all. Tan doesn't want us to do this. In some odd timing, Sarah is now awake. We bring her up to speed on the recent events, and the other Pathfinders help us steal the Tempest to head to Meridian without permission. There, we're looking for something called the Meridian Engine. We quickly find out that the Jardon, the ones that created the Remnant, sent the Meridian Engine away to save it from the opposition. We don't know who they are, but only that they created the Scourge that's plaguing space. We also learn that the Jardon were genetically engineering the Angaran people. We get ready for the final mission as we find the way to Meridian, but the Archon has taken the Hyperion captive. He's trapped us and turns off Ryder's implant, effectively killing him. It's at this moment that we play Sarah briefly. She's back on the ship and has to restart Ryder's implant to keep him alive. I genuinely thought that there would be more to Sarah as a character. When we started the game, we got to customize her appearance, so I figured there would be a massive reason for this, but it's seemingly just so we can play her for five seconds. Now we have to take the Hyperion back from the Archon as he reveals that he'll use the vaults to exalt everyone. We get some different cutscenes during the final assault based on the choices that we made. Whether we save the exaltation facility, if we had a military focus for our first settlement. There's a few of them, but realistically they don't actually matter, they just show up. The Hyperion crew has crash landed into Meridian and were guided through this facility by Sarah. We eventually have one final boss, the Architect Worm. We have to kill tons of enemies while moving across the room and activating panels. We overload these panels and kill the Archon. After this, we get a brief epilogue. The human colonists have begun to inhabit Meridian as their new home. Tan and the rest confront Ryder and want him to choose an ambassador for the initiative. I chose the Solarian Pathfinder, Reka. There's a party celebrating the success of the mission and we can talk to our friends throughout the Hyperion. Ryder wants to head out, but the crew gives him their thanks and respect. This is the end of the main story, or what it calls Priority Ops, but there's another quest that gives us another kind of epilogue to the game. Ryder Family Secrets lets us find glowing lights around all the different planets. These are memory triggers and will activate Alec Ryder's memories within Sam. We unlock his memories over time, revealing the origins of the Andromeda Initiative. 
Alec's wife, Ryder's mom, was sick. She was dying, and he began to create Sam as a way to use AI to assist human biology. This also further builds into the narrative that Alex was a bad father, with a memory that has him basically knowing nothing about his grown-up kids. Over time, we find out that there was a benefactor behind the initiative. This benefactor provided the funds to start the project in the first place. We never find out who this person is, but there are many theories. Some think it was the elusive man, some think that it was the shadow broker, Liara, some think that it was Addison, some just think it was an entirely new character. But I don't think we're ever going to find the answer. We find some messages in Alex's terminal and realize that Liara had sent him a transmission in 2186, warning him about the Reaper attacks. Alec chose not to let people know just yet because it would have been a massive blow to morale for the project. We also find out that Alec joined the project so that he could put his wife in cryo and halt her disease. The twins' mother, who they thought was dead, is actually alive in cryosleep. They need to find a cure before they wake her up because the cryo has stunted the growth of her disease. We also end up looking into Gian Garson's death here and find out she was murdered by somebody behind the project, probably the benefactor, for an unknown reason. After we beat Mass Effect Andromeda, we can go clean up and complete any side quests or content that we didn't do. This means loyalty missions, planet viability, Helios tasks, research and development, whatever we want. The loyalty missions are one thing that I haven't talked about too much. I'm not going to go through every single one of these, but I'll just talk about my opinions on them briefly. I think this is a fantastic idea, and I loved it when it was in Mass Effect 2. I think it does work pretty well here. In that game, they actually tied into the fates of the characters, making them a little more meaningful, but it's still not bad in practice. It's always great to have more content that lets you get to know your crew members, especially if they're going to be with you for the whole game. It develops their characters more, makes them more real, and makes you feel like you're genuinely part of the team. Now, the only issue with that is Andromeda's characters aren't the greatest. Korra is kind of bland, Liam is incredibly annoying, PB can also be kind of annoying, but Jal is cool. I don't know. It's hard to care about the characters that you don't feel are well written in the first place. It's another example of the entire thing that this game has going on. Good concepts in theory and poor execution. Mass Effect Andromeda is a bad game. It's genuinely not good, and I didn't have a good time playing it. That doesn't mean that I don't think the developers wanted to make something good. I think technical issues got in the way of development time, and they probably just needed to extend the cycle a little longer, maybe even have some better direction. Even now with the patches, the game has a ton of tech issues. Bugs plagued my playthrough, and the animations still aren't great. It's a far cry from the game that released, the one that spawned tons and tons of memes, but it's still not all there. Half of the cutscenes felt like the rigging and characters were being barely held together. Models are constantly shaking for some reason, and it just feels like at any moment they're going to implode, limbs flying everywhere. You can just tell the game is being held together with sticks and band-aids. Performance wasn't great either. I was playing this on the PS5 and I was still getting frame drops and performance issues the entire time that I played it. It's a rough experience from start to finish. I wasn't a huge fan of the combat, but I know some people are. Through all of the research that I did for Andromeda, most of what I found was that the story and most of the game kind of sucked, but the combat was its redeeming feature. I don't really think I even agree with this. I mean, I think the combat can be fun, but we have such little option here of what to do. We can craft a character all day, but at the end of it, we can only use a few powers. It feels like a devolution in some ways and an evolution in others. This is the crux of Andromeda, a game that feels like it was moving forward and backwards at the same time. The ideas of making Mass Effect a quick-paced, run-around, dashing, and attack shooter is fantastic, but taking away our freedom in combat isn't great. This applies to nearly everything else as well. The dialogue system is a fantastic idea. Fans had complained for years that Mass Effect's dialogue system was too black and white. There were too many options that were incredibly 50-50 and people wanted to be able to pick something in the middle. They started to fix this with Mass Effect 3, but the team was right that the entire system needed to be undone. But what we got was a system that reduced every option to a witty quip. We can't be the super serious character in this game. The option just 
isn't there. We're always being some kind of uplifting, rational person, no matter what the choice is. For all of its faults, the Paragon Renegade system was fun. One of my favorite parts of making these videos was showing off the Renegade side of Mass Effect. I never really played Renegade or Bad Guy playthroughs in these games when I was younger, so getting to go back and make all the terrible choices felt great. Not only that, but being able to roleplay as the character in the script has always been fun as well. I was so incredibly bummed when I realized that I couldn't really do that for this video. Not only was I disappointed that I didn't get to make the video in the ways that I had been for previous entries, but I was just disappointed in the series. It really made me realize how wildly different this was to the original project. It's a moment that makes you think, where the fuck are we? What are we doing here? Why? The game's story follows the same template as everything else, a really interesting idea and concept, traveling to a new galaxy and becoming explorers, developing settlements on planets that have hopefully not been settled yet, expanding the colonization of the galaxy, but it devolves into this tale about fighting the Ket, a bland retread of old ideas. It becomes this YA novel level story. Oh no, my dad died, now I have all this power and responsibility, but I'm just a young guy who has a twin sister that's also pretty powerful too, and together we're gonna stop the guys that killed my dad. It's so bland, and it's just nothing. An open world is also a fantastic idea for a Mass Effect game. It's one of the series that I think genuinely could do something great with it. Exploring new planets that we haven't seen, given the freedom to run around and solve new mysteries of this foreign galaxy, but it's just turned into a rehash of every other open world game, and it's not even a good rehash. An empty world, uninteresting characters, a bland story, restrictive combat, this game isn't anything. I'm sure there are some Andromeda fans out there right now that don't like hearing me trash this game. I don't mind if you like it at all, but this game just does not appeal to my tastes whatsoever. It is a nothing game. On a technical level, I would probably give it higher scores than a game that's actually atrocious and hilariously bad, but this game is even more offensive than that because it isn't even funny bad. It's disappointing bad. It's bland bad. It's nothing bad. This game is a neutral in existence. It's definitely even. It has brought nothing into the world with it, and it will take nothing other than my time and money. Mass Effect Andromeda was met with incredibly poor fan reception on release. It was memed to death. People were not happy with the unfinished product that they were delivered. The PS4 version of the game has a 5.0 on Metacritic for its fan score, and a 71 for its critic score. Critics didn't mind the game as much. A lot spoke out about the story being bland, the world being empty, and the overall product being boring and broken. We don't have any exact sales numbers for Andromeda, so we don't really know how well or poorly that it did. The expectations for the game were high, most hoping that it would sell 3 to 5 million units. The game wasn't in the top 10 best selling of the year, but the EA CEO had said that despite the fan reactions, the game actually sold really well. There were originally plans to continue the Andromeda series of games. EA and BioWare wanted to add to this new world. You can clearly tell that from playing the game. There's lots more to be discovered here with this story, but because of the backlash the game got, that seems to have been abandoned, and this is the last Mass Effect game to have been released. But that's not the end for our journey into the Mass Effect universe. There is still lots to talk about with this series in the form of books, comics, and even an animated film. But we'll talk about that next time. Bye, Dad.